In each of the previous episodes of this series, we've looked at autopomorphies that were diagnostic of the featured clay, except for the last episode, where ours was the only lineage to retain a synapomorphy inherited from an ancestral clade, meaning that our ancestors kept a trait that was lost in their sister set. That last episode was also the first time we had multiple extant lineages from one clade and could thus trace a phylogenetic ancestry by comparing DNA from each surviving group. And this episode offers a bonus to this series in that specific locations of retroposons and large DNA sequence analyses have revealed a couple more evolutionary stages than have yet been indicated in fossils. To explain, one of the laws of evolution has been labeled the law of biodiversity, that the further back in time you look, whether it's into the fossil record or sequential stages of embryological development or even the basis of the genome, the simpler and more similar living things appear to be because they're more closely related. Each of these modern mammal groups, which still exist today, have their own diagnostic characteristics, some of which we'll talk about in upcoming episodes. There are also a few other mammalian orders that aren't listed here because they're all extinct and we don't have their DNA. We only know about them through fossils. We can tell where they should go in the street based on their morphology, and we'll talk about those soon too, but the earliest examples of all of these were strikingly similar to each other. So it's possible that all of these, now profoundly different groups, could have radiated from one ancestral parent who would have looked an awful lot like a shrew or an American possum, being the most generalized form mammals ever had, this was the template they're all based on. Before we had whole genomes to compare, that's how scientists depicted this radiation, as an unrestricted proliferation of meager mammals taking over the smoking ruins of an earlier world left to them after the demise of the dinosaurs. Rather like raccoons will do after we're gone. But as we've seen throughout the series so far, this extent of biodiversity from a single radiation isn't very likely without a pattern of prior divisions into different branches, such as we saw indicated in the previous episode. So while this entire series up to this point has been a list of transitional species, comparative genomics implies that there are still a couple links missing right here. There are no unique anatomical features by which to identify the order of these basal divisions, but there are a few genetic indicators in the form of molecular fossils, matching gene sequences, and other chemical clues that we'll talk about later on. For example, bats were once classified into two different groups, with microbats associated with insectivores and megabats being classified along with primates, because their skeletons look so much like colugos, which are also called flying lemurs because they look so much like prosimians. At one time, colugos looked like the origin of both bats and primates, but it turns out that all bats are in the same family, and they are genetically more closely associated with rhinos than with primates, even though that just doesn't seem right at first thought. And this is where we have to talk about not just genetic, but also anatomical homology, because remember that every order of mammal is derived from the same original template, as revealed in embryos, genomes, and of course taxonomy, especially of fossils. And notice that the wing of a bat has five fingers and looks very similar to a human hand. Bats are of the order Chiroptera, and one of the genetically identified sister groups is Parasodactyla, which includes horses, tapirs, rhinos, and extinct oddities like the claw-hooved Calicotherium. Their earliest forms had five toes, too. We see a shared ancestral lineage that started out very small, like everything else, and they started losing toes as they got bigger and bigger going from five toes to four, down to three, and, and this is where the rhinoceros collective branch off, keeping three toes in each foot. And the line that would become equines continued to run with most of their weight on their middle toe until the other two vestigial toes eventually disappeared. Looking again at that five-fingered hand or five-toed foot that all mammals started with, we see that the flipper of a whale still has five fingers and all the same bones that are in your hand or in a bat's wing because they all started out the same and have since been adapted to different abilities. We'll talk more about each of these lineages later. Right now, though, we need to understand that we're getting ahead of ourselves, that we're only in the late Cretaceous period when the dinosaurs were still around, and that way back then, the progenitors of each of these modern mammalian groups looked virtually identical to each other, regardless how remarkably different we know that their descendants will become. So we might actually have the intermediate links we need because we have late Cretaceous fossils of eutherian mammals all over Eurasia, but they don't look like transitional species because there's little or no transition to observe. Just about the only way we can tell them apart at this stage is by their molecular fingerprint. 
At this point, we have the otherwise indistinguishable beginnings of four major divisions of all placental mammals we know of today. Last episode, we looked at how Boreoeutheria split from Atlanta Genata, which was divided between Xenarthrans in South America and Afrotherians in Africa. Boreoeutheria also divided into the two remaining placental superorders, emerging and diverging from what was then the supercontinent of Laurasia. Actually, Laurasia was the same thing as the modern supercontinent of Eurasia, except that it was under much higher sea levels and was consequently an unrecognizable cluster of islands separated by shallow seas, patrolled at that time by the last surviving genus of ichthyosaurs, a once plentifully diverse group that has since faded into oblivion without explanation. The Laurasiotherians, meaning mammals of Laurasia, include shrews, pangolins, carnivorans, bats, and two categories of hooved mammals, depending on whether they're odd-toed, like horses and rhinos, or even-toed, like pigs, cattle, and deer. And this group also includes whales, even though they're odd-toed and don't have hooves at all anymore. We'll explain more about that later in the series. But the clade we're talking about today is the fourth placental superorder called Euarchontogliers. And that name is a combination of two subordinate clades, Archontids, which is the subject of the next video, and Glyers, which is like a combination of rodents and rabbits. The molecular clock of relaxed mutation rates based on maximum parsimony implies that Laurasiotherians and Euarchontogliers diverged just over 98 million years ago, early in the Upper Cretaceous period. Similar studies of the molecular clock show that it would be another 10 to 20 million years before the emergence of the first rodents and lagomorphs. Today, the only lagomorphs we have left are hares, rabbits, and pikas. But the fossil record reveals a couple hundred species in 75 genera, so they were a lot more diverse then than they are now. And that goes for rodents, too, with some becoming very different than the way they began. As long as there's been rodents, there have been some that look a bit ratty, because again, that's the most generalized of all mammal shapes. So regardless how they turned out, this is how they started out, looking not a lot different from tree shrews in the sister clade of Arconta. So at this point, our ancestral lineage is still represented by this squirrely shrew thing. To see how similar the last common ancestor of both Euarchonta gliers and Laurasiotherians would have looked, recognize that there's not a lot of difference between common shrews and tree shrews. Yet, they're on different sides of this division. So the last common ancestor of both groups obviously looked like that too. And that's why we have to study these fossils under magnification, trying to find any indicative trait in things that look so much alike. Every episode of this series has ended with an explanation of how you and I are defined as belonging to whatever the featured clade happens to be. This chapter is an exception in that it is the only one indicated strictly by genetics and morphological affinities rather than by an unambiguous character trait diagnostic of your position within that set. It's like if you didn't know who your father was, but it's down to two guys who look enough like you that you can't tell, so you have to rely on a paternity test rather than recognition of familial features. Or perhaps a better analogy would be if you traced your ethnicity genetically, or examined your family connections through a genealogy. Except that instead of finding out that you're cousins with James Cagney, it turns out that you're much more distantly related to an actual dirty rat.